All right. Um, good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. My name is Matthew Dodder. I'm the executive director of Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, and welcome to speaker series. Uh, this is one of the uh, one of the first few that we've done that's completely um, online, for obvious reasons. Uh, we make these uh, events open to the public uh, almost monthly throughout the year, and uh, we hope that you enjoy it. Tonight, we're going to be welcoming uh, Luis Villablanca. But uh, before we get there, I've got to let in a couple more people. And I just want to tell you, if you're not familiar with uh, Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, we're uh, dedicated to the promotion of birds and the protection of their habitat and other wildlife. Uh, we uh, have a, a rich education program. Uh, we're active uh, with environmental advocacy. And uh, we normally take a lot of people on birding trips, on field, field trips. And Eve is our field trip coordinator. There I see her in the crowd. Um, now, of course, we are not doing field trips, but we're doing more remote content and distance learning. And uh, we have a, a huge video program coming up at the end of this week, the annual Wildlife and Harvest Festival. So if you haven't already seen the announcements for that, you should uh, take a look at our website and there's an announcement there. We have close to 50 videos from various organizations around the Bay Area, all having to do with wildlife and environment. And uh, it's primarily uh, an event for uh, elementary school kids. But I know from having watched all of the videos that uh, adults will find them interesting too. So anyway, I want to tell you just a, a little bit about Luis before we let him uh, take the helm. He was uh, born in Chile and he uh, spent his schooling years there before uh, moving to Switzerland for nine years and then finally to the United States in 2001. He's in the tech industry, but uh, I get the feeling that his real passion is birding in the Sierra Nevada. So what he's going to talk about tonight is birds in the Sierra. And um, perhaps many of you have been there outside of spring or summer. I've only been there in spring and summer. So I really don't know what happens the rest of the year. And Luis has uh, made a career of documenting all the birds and species that he can find in the Sierra throughout the year. So um, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to tell you. He's an active member of the Bird Area Bird Photographers Group. And I think uh, Steve Zemeck, who heads that up, is also in the crowd tonight. So perhaps at some point, Steve, you can send in um, a link in the chat down below and uh, make that uh, available to other folks. And also, if you have any questions that you'd like Luis to answer at the end of his program, uh, type them into the chat and I will take, them, take a look at them while he's speaking and try to um, collect them so that at the end of his talk we can uh, ask him the questions one by one. Anyway, I am going to let, um, let, uh, let me see, more, more. Uh, oops, Luis Yabanka, hang on. Luis. You may uh, take it away. Right. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Um, so let me see. Uh, let me let me get started. Um, so give me a second while I, I set up there the screen sharing here. Can you see the the first page? Absolutely. Yes. All right. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So um, I'll be, uh, uh, as you said, I'll be talking about uh, Sierra Nevada. Um, thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, this, uh, you know, will cover um, tr several trips that I've made over the span of uh, about 10 years uh, since actually I, I first went there. Uh, uh, you can see me here on my first trip. Uh, I'm with, uh, you know, a couple of friends, uh, uh, Ganesh, uh, uh, who moved to back to India, and uh, Larry Salman, and um, we were photographing a a white-headed woodpecker 
that was uh, nested right next to the parking lot at Juba Pass back then. Uh, so uh, after, you know, over the years, I've uh, kind of uh, started to like the area. And uh, oh, hold on a second, this thing is not, it's not going forward. Okay. And um, I've made trips to several points, uh, you know, around the, around the Sierra Nevada. You can see it's, it's a large area, uh, but I've been to uh, places like Lassen, uh, uh, some areas near Fresno. You know, I go pick up, my, I used to go to pick up my, my, my children at the Boy Scout camp there, you know, and there were birds around there. Uh, or near uh, Mammoth Lakes, um, where, you know, we've been a few times with family on vacation, then, you know, early in the morning, I go out and, uh, and explore the area and try to find woodpeckers or you know any bird that that's interesting around there. So, but the main area that which I uh, which I like to visit is uh, uh, called the Sierra Valley. It's uh, located uh, uh, north of uh, Truckee. Um, so you take uh, uh, Route 89 north of Truckee and get to this valley. It's a gorgeous valley, in particular in the spring. Um, it has uh, several habitats, lots of birds. Um, and uh, uh, so I usually um, go around, uh, it, you know, the main valley inclu including uh, Hedrick Lane, Marble Hot Springs. Uh, I may go to National Lane. Um, then I might go to Calpine, uh, go uh, Yuba Pass, uh, Gold Lakes, uh, and, uh, and beyond, you know, Plumas, uh, National Forest, and so on. Um, so, uh, in the winter, um, you know, when my family goes to ski, I kind of don't like skiing, so I uh, I go away and uh, you know escape in the morning and uh, visit uh, Sierra Valley and see what I can find. So in the, in the winter, usually you know there's snow, the, the conditions might not be that great for driving, but you know if you're careful, you can make it there. It can be very cold, you know, temperatures in the lower 20s sometimes. But uh, there's some gorgeous landscapes, uh, like you know, that I could try to show here. But there are some birds, in particular in the winter. Uh, I've run into uh, uh, raptors. You know, they go there, especially when there's uh, a, a good uh, population of rodents, voles, and so on. Um, and uh, the most common one is the red-tailed hawk. But then, you know, some interesting ones show up too, um, like a uh, ferruginous hawk, which sometimes you, you can see here in the valley, but, uh, you know, I, I, I have a hard time finding them here. Over there, usually I, I, I'm luckier and you can find a few. And uh, you can see this, uh, this hawk, uh, you know, even spent uh, the night out, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just during a snowstorm and it got a little bit of snow on it. You can find Castro as well. Uh, and uh, you can see it's also on the snow. Uh, bald eagle. I still don't have a good shot of a bald eagle over there, but I, I thought I, I would show you this one because it's uh, still nonetheless a, a, an impressive bird. Uh, a rough legged hawk. You can find it uh, some years. Uh, also, a, a difficult bird to, to photograph. Uh, at least for me, uh, this this case, uh, the shot was backlit, so I wish it would, I would have got uh, better lighting. But sometimes, you know, I, I get lucky and um, and driving on the road, uh, you know, I find uh, an owl, like in this case, a barn owl. Um, it was uh, perched on Highway 49, so I was driving towards uh, Loyalton. Uh, so I, then I, I quickly turned around and uh, and stopped nearby and saw it hunting. So it went uh, a couple of times through the wall and gave me a couple of opportunities uh, to, to get uh, you know, flat shots. Another bird that showed up uh, um, a few years ago, like maybe three years ago, uh, was uh, a shorty owl. Uh, they show in good numbers. There's usually a few, but uh, this time there were, there were many. Uh, so I went there. Um, and uh, try to find uh, a good spot to, you know, to photograph it. And uh, as uh, you can see, I, in this case, I found one, but it wasn't probably the best uh, 
point of view, you can see the, the, the front is all abstracted, it was far away. So I thought, what, what, can, you, what can I do? So I kept driving a little more, and I noticed that, you know, from the other side of the fence, I got a little bit of a better angle. Uh, this uh, fence was right next to a, an access uh, point to a ranch, so there was a gate uh, and a little bit of a driveway going down. But I was driving on my Prius, and uh, uh, there was a lot of water there. Um, so it was flooded, so, but I decided to just uh, making it, uh, make, make it a little bit uh, further and uh, so, and uh, you know, test if the animal was, uh, was a little bit, uh, you know, skittish, if I was getting nervous, but he just kept looking at me, so it didn't really matter. Uh, so I got a little closer, now I was able to eliminate the fence from the, from the shot and uh, you know isolate uh, the bird and the, with the with the rain falling ar around it and eventually made it uh, you know as close as i i, I could get uh, and waited for it to go so eventually it i don't know something came close and, and i took off and then i i was able to leave uh, later it started uh, snowing so it gave me the chance to get a, a few shots of uh, you know the shorter owl in in the snow, um, and uh, you know, sometimes he also gave me some some shots uh, perched on, on, on you know more of a habitat, uh, so I could uh, I could give you a sense of uh, you know what the habitat looks like. So moving to the spring, uh, early spring, uh, let's say late March, early early April. Uh, birds start actually singing. Um, you can find uh, horn larks. Uh, in this case, apparently had snowed recently, um, so it was singing on what it could. Snow um, gave some some poses. This one had some fresh plumage. Uh, uh, gave me some nice views. You can find uh, western meadowlark, where, which is a bird I really like. You know, for their their song, it's very nice. Um, they, in this case, it also yeah, gave me, one of them gave me an opportunity for a pre takeoff shot, you know, that came out reasonably sharp, so I can share it with you. And uh, they also, um, well, I, I'm going to share in the, the presentation a few videos, um, so you can, uh, you know, I can share with you the, 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 the songs which I really like. So hopefully you can hear, you can hear it and like it. Okay, so uh, this particular trip, um, uh, my target was a bird that uh, is endangered um, and uh, very, very skittish, a greater sage grouse, um, and required a lot of uh, logistic uh, to get there uh, to, to photograph it actually. Um, so I had to get up super early, be at the spot uh, two hours uh, before sunrise or maybe three hours. Um, walk in the dark uh, to some uh, rock blinds, uh, you know, hide myself uh, and uh, and then wait for the birds to come in, which was pretty cool in the morning to, you know, hear birds uh, moving around. I couldn't even see anything, but they were already arriving. And then they started displaying. So, and I, and I really liked the, the way they display, you know, they have this, this boom, they have these sacks, um, air sacks, you know, which they inflate and they, you know, to give you some, some very nice views. So other birds that you can find uh, up there uh, is, uh, you know, the black magpie, which is, I think, uh, the uh, southernmost limit of the range. So I don't think you can find it uh, further south. Um, it's a nice, nice bird, you know, similar to our uh, yellow-beaked magpie that you have here. 
Another bird I like is the Sage Thrasher. I love their songs. Like uh, you know, they're like an endless uh, song sometimes. Uh, it was this was a, a very hard bird for me to get uh, for a few years, and then a couple of years ago there was this one that was um, that, that was very active around the road on Henry Lane. So I just uh, would stop the car and wait for it to do something, and uh, sometimes it would give me you know like this time it jumped on a on a bush and started singing, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of their of their song. I'm sorry, uh, the, the video is a little bit uh, unstabilized. I, I didn't have anything to stabilize my lens. Another bird that uh, you wouldn't expect to see up there is the waylet. We used to see them here in the at the coast, um, usually in a very dry plumage. Um, however, uh, come spring and they they migrate. They go up to the valleys um, and they change a little bit their, their plumage. They, they look a little bit more interesting than than around here. So not 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 as plain. And they also uh, you can find them. Of post uh, central skanking. Another bird that I really like uh, seeing there um, uh, is the Swainson's hawk. Um, the, this uh, this one year where you can find many of them and uh, uh, in many uh, morphs like this one is a, a dark one a dark morph this one is a red morph um, and then this is like a more regular one that you that you see uh, that you find over there and here's a, a close up of the of the of the hawk and um, this particular year. Um, I was talking about, uh, I went back there later in the spring and uh, I found again the short-eared owls. Um, interestingly, there was um, this bear that uh, was, I think, nesting uh, near uh, the road, near here at uh, Lane, actually, uh, you know, for the back in the, in, in the farm. Uh, so I would go out, um, catch a bowl and then drop it, uh, back there where I think was a nest, I could, I could never see it, but, but they would uh, always uh, perch on the, on, the, on the road, on the on, on nice uh, weathered uh, fence posts and, um, uh, you know, sit and relax. So if you approach them very slowly, they, they wouldn't mind. And uh, there's uh, this one, one time where um, uh, I was almost done for a day and I went back to check them out and uh, there was this one that was uh, sleeping. Um, so I, I parked in front of it and uh, uh, waited for it to wake up and do something that really didn't care for me. So I woke up and started uh, scratching itself, doing different poses. Um, and then uh, this one's the one that really struck me that, uh, you know, where I started stretching the wings slowly. One, one wing, you can see the claw there, the talons, so very nice. And here it started uh, doing a stretch until eventually it gave me this pose that I, that I really liked. You can see the, the tail feathers, uh, they all fanned out because it was, uh, it was windy, so the wind was coming my way, so they kind of spread the, the tail a little bit. Uh, then um, after I, I visit usually this, uh, Harriet Lane or Tyson Road uh, area, I, I head out to Marble Hot Springs. Uh, you can see this uh, bridge underneath uh, the bridge. You can find usually uh, tons of swallows nesting. And also before and after the bridge and all the marshes, uh, you can find all sorts of um, birds. Um, so you can see a few views of the, of the area. You can see here all the 
for the swallows is taken from the bridge. You can see all the fl swallows flying around. So you find uh, blackbirds, uh, like a bluish blackbird there, uh, or the yellow-headed blackbird, which I, I really like because the, the way it contorts itself when it, when it sings. The song is kind of ugly, but uh, it's kind of typical of the area. Um, this year, I, I, I bought a, a new camera and I wanted to try it there with, for, for birds in flight. So I was very happy that I, I was able to get some, some nice sequences like, like this one. Uh, you can see that the bird was flying uh, in, you know, across its territory and uh, eventually landed on a bush to the left. Another bird that you find there is the Welsh snipe. It's uh, not unusual to see them um, singing, kind of japping on on the on top of a, of a fence post. Um, so, and if you're driving slowly, it um, they, they they just don't mind very much, and they continue doing their thing. Uh, this year, I I I was lucky that uh, one of them, for some reason, decided to fly uh, around uh, where I was, uh, and. Uh, I was able to get this shot of it uh, in flight. And also later it came kind of flying towards me. I don't know if there was a, a check or something uh, nearby that we wanted to uh, protect. Um, you know, I was on the, just on the road. Uh, and, um, but I think there was something in the, in the bush uh, not too far from where I was. So it, it gave a few passes around uh, and then, you know, it then stopped uh, flying. Another bird that you can see uh, around there is a mushroom. Um, it's, um, you know, sometimes they just jump on, on uh, any cattail and, you know, start singing. Uh, other birds that you can see are the uh, sandhill crane. Um, I like this particular shot because it had all those uh, rusty colors um, on, the, on the feathers. Um, and uh, yeah, um, sometimes you can see them in flight. But uh, yeah, this one didn't like that. I stopped the car on the road and, uh, you know, wasn't too far from the road, but uh, it decided that it didn't like, didn't like me and, and took off. Another bird that uh, is a little secretive, but sometimes you can find it out in the open is the, the American bittern. Um, this one was uh, uh, walking underneath the bridge. So I just uh, found a space uh, where to, you know, put my, my lens through and, uh, and got a few shots like these two. And then um, I also once uh, got this uh, flat shot. Uh, uh, there were some people from the Cornell Labs, I think, if I remember well, they were making recordings of, recordings of sounds from the area. And, um, and uh, they flushed it. So I, oh, sorry. Sorry, Mike. Um, so they flashed it and I, I got a shot of, the, of it in flight. And I'm going to show you, uh, there was this other, other time I was uh, driving, um, a, it was foggy, I was driving along a Marble Hot Spring uh, road. And, um, and then there was this uh, beta on, the, on, on the, one of the ditches there. So, um, and it flashed um, and it went to land on a nearby field. Uh, but it stayed there out in the open and then started doing this. Until it moved away. So um, some years, uh, uh, you can see Wilson's Valley Ropes, uh, different places around the valley. Uh, this is one year where uh, there was some good amount of rain and uh, the road flooded. And uh, the Wilson's Valley Road kind of liked the ponds that uh, built up on the road. Um, this was, again, Marble Hot Springs uh, uh, Road. And uh, uh, so, you know, one of my friends gave me a trip and I went there and, um, and, this, and this bird was just uh, walking on the, on the puddle. So I got an opportunity I just light, um, laid down on the floor um, uh, flat and, and got a few uh, 
eye level shots of it uh, feeding. So this is a female, which is, has a nicer plumage uh, compared to the to the male species. Um, then you can also find some ducks. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, here put the image here. Sorry, it's it's a redhead, um, and um, yeah, this one is kind of a skittish duck. I I kind of like this this shot, but I decided to, I I was going to to show it uh, because you know, for me it's a it's a hard part to to get, uh, but I think it also, it breeds there together with the cinnamon teal. This is a female, um, here's a male, cinnamon teal. And, and this is right next to, you know, the the, the beginning of the, of the road uh, where, um, you know, there's a farm there. Um, um, there's also ruddy duck that um, breeds in the area. Um, and in this case, um, I, I photographed it doing the the, the bubble the courtship. It's generally it's very fast. You can see this with uh, um, the naked eye, but uh, uh, you know, if you freeze the action, you can see all the bubbles that it makes. That is another view of it. Another bird that you can see around there um, that nests nests in the in, in the marsh is uh, the white-faced ibis. Uh, this this one year there were there were lots of flights around uh, not too far from from the road um, so we just waited for them to, to get close with the material and uh, and do some some landings which you know gave some nice views um, I like the colors uh, particular uh, in the afternoon the colors really really popped with the with, with the golden light. And here's a, a sequence of one landing in the marsh. Um, another bird that you can find in the Sierra, though not not in Marble, in the in Sierra Valley, but um, in some other places um, like in the Eastern Sierra, is the ear grebe. There's some um, at least I know of a colony, um, which is not far from Mammoth. Uh, so I've um, I've been there a couple of times, you know, one of them, uh, I got a, a chance to, to go photograph them at I lab. Um, uh, let, me, let me get somewhere. In. So another bird that I tried to photograph this year, I, I really never had good photos of, of them, are the swallows. Um, as I said, uh, they, nest um, uh, out on the, under the bridge. And, and this year, it was um, a little bit uh, late when I found them. So they had all the, the, the chicks had fledged um, and, and they were still flying around and, uh, and going in and out around the, around the bridges. Um, so which gave me a good opportunity to get uh, some flight shots. Um, um, so yeah, another view of the, of the area, so I'm going to move uh, further away from from the marshes, more into uh, uh, more grassy areas, uh, you know, uh, brushy areas, um, and then where you can find other types of birds. You find, uh, for instance, the poor sparrow. Um, you can you can hear its song usually when you go there. Uh, and you can also hear the vesper sparrow, which is um, you know the two most common sparrows I would say in the in the area. And here I'm going to show you a a message sparrow singing. Okay. So in the Eastern Sierra, um, I found uh, other sparrows like uh, the, the sagebrush uh, sparrow, um, which I really, really like. It used to be called stage sparrow, now they changed the name. Uh, so this was a, a late trip. You can see the plumage is worn, but we're still yeah, willing to sing around. Another bird that I really like, large sparrow, is the green tailed tohi. I really love their colors. Um, and uh, you can find them throughout the, the spring. You just need to learn the songs and uh, 
uh, and uh, you know it's easy to locate them. You can hear the, the song here. Another bird that I was surprised to find was is the the rock wren um, in more you know rocky areas without few hard crops. Um, speaking of uh, um, blackbirds, uh, there's a red wing blackbird usually at the you know marshy areas in, in the other near the forest at the at the edge of the forest. Um, this is a female. Uh, Bluish blackbird, and then let's go into the forest. So I usually, you know, grab my car and drive back roads. Um, and, and I used to drive my wife's car back then. No, I have my own. Haha. <laughs> so you can get some nice views. Um, I try to check uh, and burn the uh, uh, burnt forests. Uh, Sections to see, you know, to see if I can, if I, if I get lucky with some woodpeckers, in particular black back woodpeckers. But so far, not, not too much luck there. Um, some different uh, roads. Uh, this is uh, Route 11 that uh, goes around Sage Sage Creek, uh, um, and uh, other views of the forest, uh, like uh, this was, uh, I, I think, at Inyo Craters. So. Uh, so typically, when I get to the forest uh, site, I, the first thing I hear is a uh, marten chickadee. I really love their the morning song. Um, Dark-eyed juncos are, are very common, like they are around here. But to find other birds um, that are less common here, um, like the chipping sparrow, whose song is fairly similar to the um, dark-eyed uh, junco, it's just uh, faster most of the time. Another word that I like is uh, the fox sparrow. I love their their songs. Um, and this is a, a particular subspecies up there. It's called the thick bill. You can see it has a kind of a, a thick uh, bill. Other birds you can find are house wren. Um, this year in particular, there were lots of them um, taking over lots of the uh, uh, bird boxes uh, that are, you know they have placed in the in the forest. Um, this one, I think, were too close to the to its nest, so it went up there and, and, and sang a little bit to defend its territory. Um, we used to find uh, hermit thrush that uh, sometimes go up, uh, you know, on the top of small trees, uh, or, or actually most of the time, top of very high trees, uh, and sing the song. Uh, same with the uh, this is actually Swenson's thrush. Um, sorry, missed the label. Um, I was, uh, I think, talking to a, a researcher at Yuba Pass once, um, and then out of the blue, this uh, this guy jumped on it, on the on the tree. So I decided to to take a a, a few shots. Um, pretty birds that you find there are, um, you know, warblers. You find lots of. Uh, uh, different kinds, like a uh, yellow, yellow rump uh, warbler, which uh, looks much nicer than you know the way you see them right now in the Bay Area. They they, they have this uh, striking black uh, and yellow plumage. You can also find uh, hermit warbler. Um, I love their songs, um, uh, and uh, I recently uh, found out that you can also find them in the Bay Area. It's the, the hard to find. Um, natural warbler. Uh, Another nice, uh, nice looking warbler uh, that uh, you can usually detect by their their song. Uh, they're hard to see. A yellow warbler. Um, they they like more riparian habitat. Um, so I was uh, shooting a hummingbird, and uh, and this guy made made it past uh, to the area. Magillivere's warbler. Uh, also, you can, it has a distinctive song, and um, they're very hard to see. Um, and got 
like with this one. Um, Wilson's warbler also, this also likes uh, the uh, semi riparian areas, um, you know, the border of the, of the forest. Golden crown kinglets, um, you can usually hear them. They have a, a very high pitched song. And then there's, they're very, very small and very fast. Another a, a pretty bird from the, 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 the forest is the, the western tanager, which uh, you're going to usually hear. And uh, pygmy nut hatch is one that you, you can find around there. Um, for this one, I think I, I placed a, this stick uh, a, near a, a nest that he had um, in a cavity. So they happily uh, took it as a, as a landing spot where it was going in and out. And last year, um, or this year actually, they, uh, someone gave me a tip um, where to find a, a calliope hummingbird. So I went there with the body and uh, started taking some, some shots. Actually, uh, this um, male had its uh, perch kind of, uh, it was higher than, uh, than uh, the rest of the, of the sticks around. And they don't like very pretty perches in general. Um, but uh, it will use it to to display for the females or or to do some aggression displays against males that were that were flying around. Um, so um, sometimes it, they will land on some nice perch, like uh, it gave me some some pose on this one. Um, and uh, in one opp opportunity, it uh, made this display, which. Um, I had never seen, and it was a very curious one because it would uh, uh, vibrate its uh, gorget uh, uh, against the, the leaf there. I, I removed uh, it from the picture, you know, in Photoshop, I removed lots of sticks in the background that were kind of uh, getting in the way of the picture, but uh, the bird was was doing that and they, it, was, it was just awesome. You know, it was sound like a zzz, 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 when it was uh, just uh, uh, touching it. And um, and I think it was just uh, a displaying, trying to fend off his territory against a, a rival male that was flying around. Um, another bird uh, that I find uh, is the uh, American Dipper. Um, it, this particular one um, I photographed uh, in early spring. I think it was done with the first clutch and uh, it was building a second nest. So. Uh, I, I got a few shots uh, of it uh, bringing nesting material going in and out, uh, which was kind of kind of fun. Uh, another Peter Bird is the Lewis's woodpecker. This one is uh, a famous one. Uh, uh, I think I photographed this one ten years ago, uh, but uh, I think it stayed there um, near Loyalton. Uh, I know that uh, birders uh, love to go there. And uh, a hard uh, to get a uh, woodpecker is the, the black back woodpecker. And uh, uh, last year I was uh, talking um, to a researcher uh, that, I, that I met on the road and I happened to ask him, so by any chance, do you know any, any black back woodpeckers uh, nest around here? I said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm on my way to see one uh, near this camp. So, well, I didn't wait too much, too long, and then I, I just headed to the camp uh, ground, um, and um, there were people uh, there, and uh, I drove around the campground with uh, my windows rolled down, and uh, I, I, and there you go, I hear a, a black a woodpecker, and uh, I, I stopped uh, uh, near a campsite uh, and I look around, and there it is, the bird, the bird I was looking for, and um, the. Uh, the thing is, there were uh, barking dogs around, you know, lots of noise, and the, the bird just stuck around. Um, so I just took a few shots. The light was a little bit dim, but it gave me some nice opportunities. And uh, this year, um, what with one of my buddies, I was um, I was driving on the on the road, that, you know, one of the roads at least to Yuba Pass, uh, dirt roads, and then he said, "Stop! Stop! Stop! I saw something there." So uh, I stopped, uh, 
pulled out of the car, and there you go, a pseudo grouse was there, um, and it was coming to us. And uh, actually, uh, I, th I don't think it liked us being there. There must have been some, been some, um, uh, so, some chicks or something, because it kept uh, chasing us away. Actually, uh, it uh, it uh, would peck our lenses, it would peck us, uh, our legs. So eventually, we just packed up and left. But before that, we took a, a couple of shots of it. And uh, last year, I I got lucky and. Uh, it had a, a very good chance to photograph uh, mountain quail. Uh, it gave me some nice uh, opportunities. It's a, a very tough bird, I think, to, to photograph. Um, I, I had always uh, failed uh, over these years. And then, yeah, last year I had a good chance. And it gave me a few chances on some nice perches. And I'm going to show you a video of it uh, singing. You can usually see, hear the song, but not really hear it. I mean, see it. Okay, so let's let's move into late spring, early summer. Uh, you know, baby bear time. You can see birds bringing food to their nest. Bruce sparrow here, or the Bruce blackbird in this case. Another Bruce blackbird uh, with a you know mouthful of bugs. Um, you can see the birds have a very ragged plumage like this uh, mountain bluebird. You can see that it has been sitting on, on, on eggs for a while. Uh, but then they're bringing bugs. You can see some uh, babies, like a sandhill crane that I photographed uh, uh, near Barber Hot Springs. And uh, sometimes there are birds that are hard to see, like uh, I was taking shots with a friend. Um, you know, we're taking shots of a Wilson snipe, uh, and the and the bird was acting funny, the adult, and then he jumped on the floor, and then we we knew why. There was this uh, uh, baby Wilson snipe, which we could barely see actually. I had to ask uh, my friend, "Hey, show me, show me, where is it? I cannot see it." And eventually, I I, I got a shot. So we have an excellent camouflage. Um, this year, among the, the strauss and the photograph, I also got some juveniles. Um, again, the, the birds are all fledged and they were just flying around. In this case, a, a juvenile tree swallow um, coming in for a, for a sip uh, on, a, on still water. Or um, I also got uh, a, a juvenile a cliff swallow um, that was flying around. You can see it fairly resembles uh, adult but the head looks uh, has a different color and then um, I think it was last year or two years ago um, uh, with my body where we uh, were driving um, along route 49 and then uh, we saw this this house on the on the field and uh, so we stopped uh, and took out the blinds set by the by the fence of the ranch and waited for them to, to do something. And so slowly birds started coming out and uh, eventually there were like 10 chicks that, that would uh, be out at, uh, at the same time. Um, and here I'm gonna show you a little video of, that I made in the occasion. All right, so this year, um, actually I ran into our friend uh, Bob Lewis uh, at, uh, uh, at Yuba Pass, and then I stood behind it a little bit, uh, and I noticed that uh, there was this uh, bush that had a couple of uh, Wilson's Walrus 
actually the, one of them was a juvenile and uh, dad uh, or mom wanted to uh, to feed him um, and uh, um, I could not get the, the feeding uh, because it will always happen it always happened on the on the ground uh, you know kind of in the grass uh, but uh, I got a, an image of the of the little one that was jumping around in the bush so at some point it jumped uh, on a branch in front of me and, and I got uh, a couple of shots so other birds you can see um, you know babies are a, a American deeper fledglings um, a, what uh, you know what what happens sometimes you know we, we try to photograph them uh, going into the nest uh, the parents but sometimes uh, the baby sledge and uh, so this uh, this one time uh, we captured a couple of times we decided to check uh, the the river upstream and see what was going on uh, if they were still around and sure enough they were around there and started giving us some some nice um, opportunities so we just sat there and waited for things to happen so babies would move around sometimes uh, you know the parents uh, would bring it food uh, in this frame you can see the the babies begging for food you know there was uh, one of the parents had arrived with food and then they, they you know they tried to call their attention or like uh, like this one I made that last year different trip um, this one, this one jumped on a little stick and uh, saw the the parent uh, coming in and decided to that he wanted attention. So uh, you can see it there. You can see this one getting fed. You can see I think it, it got well fed because it looks a little bit chubby. And uh, yeah, I'll show you a little bit of what, what they do. It's just, uh, it just, Getting some static. Okay. Hey, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, it sounds good now. Okay, thanks. So um, it was, uh, I think, last year. Uh, we're visiting a forest, and my friend. Uh, looked on the side, he has better eyesight than me. Uh, he saw this uh, it Western Book Theory nest. It was fairly high, um, but I decided to give it a try. You know, I was standing at a reasonable distance. So, um, you know, the, the, the pants didn't feel threatened uh, and, and uh, he just kept coming in. So I just set up my camera um, and started uh, taking, taking shots like this one, side lit. Um, then they were bringing in food, like uh, you can see, it's kind of a big snack for the for the babies. Um, if you notice, the babies don't have their their eyes open; they still have a, they have a membrane on them, kind of blind. Um, and sometimes they would bring stuff that was definitely too big for the for the little little chick. So I think in this case, uh, the the chick gave up, and uh, the parent uh, took the uh, took the bug out and I don't know, displayed it or just give it to someone else. And this is, uh, you know, showing a little bit of a setup. Um, uh, it was a branch that was fairly high, so I had to prop my camera up. Uh, I used, I improvised some some rocks that I found around. Uh, and um, uh, you can see I, I, I was using flash, I tested it, it didn't bother the birds. Um, so, but it was a little bit of a of a precarious uh, setup uh, because uh, you know everything could have come down very easily if one of the rocks uh, rolled down the, the hill. Uh, another opportunity that I had uh, last year was uh, with this uh, red-breasted red -breasted nuthatch pair, which was nesting um, near the road. It was um, near um, it wasn't the, the access road to Carmen Valley, which is another place I, yeah, I go to. Um, so you can see there, it was kind of a tricky location. Uh, it was a lot of shade uh, that was moving around. So very hard to get a, a clean sunny shot in nice light. So I decided to, to use the flash and again, I, I tested it on the, on the birds and um, they, they just didn't mind at all. 
so they kept coming in and it gave me uh, some some nice uh, opportunities like uh, you know of them being in bugs uh, here's the female net hatch uh, with the red bug um, and here's an, another shot of the female thinking another bug and then the the male leaving the the nest uh, for more food another other birds are you love to find at the end of the of the spring um, are the woodpeckers, white-haired woodpecker in this case, going into the nest. The female, this is the male. Um, a chick actually about to fledge. Um, I'll show you a little bit of this one because this one's long. Um, it would make some sounds, but I, I don't know where I left that video where I had some. So it's making some, some calls. So I'm gonna leave it here. So, um, another opportunity that uh, that I had when uh, my body was uh, with uh, Northern Flickers uh, um, and uh, and their their babies. So they would, uh, my body found this 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 uh, place. We set up uh, some blinds. Um, and um and the the birds got used to them and uh so just uh uh shut you know kind of shots um you can see the the, the female uh flicker sticking the head out there the male with personality calling out here's a little video So they would call um, a, a lot at the end, you know, and the parents would not come in. Usually, uh, I, I figured that uh, when the parents want the, the, the chicks to leave the nest, they just reduce their feeding and they force them to leave. And at some point, uh, they do so, like uh, this female. There you go, it fledged. So it was kind of cool to see. It had already happened with one of the siblings. That's why I prepared the camera uh, for it, you know, when it happened again. So other birds that you can find, other woodpeckers are the uh, red breasted sapsucker. Um, I found uh, this nest uh, at uh, Yuba Pass. It was a fairly tricky site in terms of lighting. So I had some windows in the afternoon where I could shoot without having harsh light on the nest. You can see it. Uh, bringing out some eggshells. So I think uh, some of the, some of the chicks had already, had just hatched. And uh, here's a video of one going with a, with a snack. All right, so another uh, woodpecker that I love is uh, doing some sapsucker, one of the prettiest uh, woodpeckers that we have over there. Uh, in this case, they were going to, uh, in with uh, some snack, both uh, male and female. The male is really stunning. 
and uh, this year I had another opportunity um, to shoot it. Um, and um, this time I was also able to see the check. And this one had a lot of personality. You can see here how it was uh, grabbing some of the feathers of the of mom there. I don't know what what happened to to him, but uh, yeah, he did this a couple of times. It looked really really odd. And this is uh, my setup, you know. Um, yeah, so you can see, you know, how, how I'm shooting this a very skittish bird. So I I tried to use um, a, a blind around and um, just to reduce a little bit the, the anxiety of the birds in their skittish and uh, and it worked out and a, a video of the little guy all right so that's it thank you very much for your attention So, um, Luis, do you want to hand back controls? Yeah. Give me a second. Stop sharing. Uh, okay. Well, that was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, you know, I've I've never been to uh, uh, Yuba Pass or Sierra Valley during this during the uh, winter, but now you've made me want to go there, and you make me want to go with you. <laughs> I think I think you see some incredible stuff, and you make it look so easy. Uh, but it's just phenomenal. I I am so impressed with the imagery that you're able to capture. I know how difficult it is to see these birds just with binoculars, but to carry that big equipment out there uh, with you and the patience it takes to get those pictures, it's just mind blowing. But we did get a few questions, so I wanna I wanna ask those. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to know, did you really drive the Prius up there through all that snow? Uh, well, it wasn't really, there wasn't much snow and I was getting worried actually that it would start <laughs> snowing. <laughs> it okay. was a little bit too wet though, but when I, when I arrived, uh, but then uh, it closed up, uh, you know, and I got worried, but I, I left there just before they closed the road. No, that's good. <laughs> um, so uh, we had a couple questions about cameras and, and one question was, do we do you have a recommendation for an entry level camera that a, a really dedicated beginner uh, might be able to afford and would be good to practice with? Uh, it would depend on the on the on, on the brand, of course. Um, right now, uh, I, Canon hasn't updated the cameras in a while. My my latest Canon was a a seventy Mark II, which I used for years. Um, um, moving on to then i moved to nikon um and uh, they are thing a d500 it's a crop camera uh but very capable um, mm -hmm. it's a very good option and uh, on the sony side um entry level in a60 i think 600 also another crop camera is, is affordable uh pretty good um uh mirrorless uh on the nikon side and mirrorless could be a, a z five which i think was just released um uh, as an entry level camera I, I heard it's pretty good do you uh and then do you, you have how, sorry go ahead. i was going to ask if you like the mirrorless uh, uh development yeah actually I, I i moved to sony uh this uh this summer uh because of the mirrorless features um i was using a a, a, a nikon z7 and uh I found it to be a little slow in the autofocus uh, department uh, uh, for what I do. Uh, but with the Sony, I bought the Sony A9, um, and um, it's really mind blowing. Yeah. Well, you know, I have a I have a an iPhone, so I get <laughs> some pretty. <laughs> this this is my only camera right now, so <laughs> anything would be an upgrade. Uh, but uh, I so there's uh, I had a question also about um, are there any birds in the Sierra that you've not been able to photograph yet, or any that you feel like you really need to get a better shot of? Yeah, actually, um, Spotted Owl is on the top of my list now. I, okay. It's so difficult to get uh, a shot of those. Um, but uh, not, not many are, la are left, I think, from the ones that are, that are uh, around there. 
Uh, mm. I always like to, you know, improve the shots, get some uh, different poses and so on. Yeah. Well, if I if I recall correctly, you're still looking for flammulated owl. Is that right? Oh, that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Owls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. I might be able to give you some tips on both of those, but we'll we'll see. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Oh, yeah. Uh, a couple of questions about your beautiful uh, diffuse background for the swallow oh. shots in particular. Uh, but I also noticed it in a, in a number of other shots where the background was so beautifully unobst unobstructive. Um, how did you accomplish that? Right. This is just optics. Um, yeah, I, I tried to use a, a long lens, 500 to 600 uh, millimeters, uh, f4. Uh, the focal length on its own gives you the most of the of the blur. Um, then it gets tricky because the what's called the depth of field, which is a, the section that's in focus, is very thin, very so thin. So it's usually half an inch or so, which for smaller birds is not it's not a big deal. You have to get them more or less aligned, uh, you know, and uh, we do kind of squared in front of you, and uh, and then most of them will be in focus. Uh, but it can be it can get tricky, so it's it's a compromise uh, usually, yeah. and you try to also get the patterns distant enough so, such that it, it it will it will blur. Do you do any post production on your images? Yes, yes, I do. Um, in general, to remove a, a few elements, not always, but uh, I, I remove a branch, for instance, uh, um, the, the the shot of the of the baby Wilson's warbler had a had a branch on the top which I removed. Uh, you know, just to make it more placing money. But uh, as a rule, you know, I don't add any any elements. Right, and it sounds like you accomplish most everything in camera with just a bare minimum of post-production like that. Right, so little distractions, yeah, are, are, are removed. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a question about the sage grouse, whether you had been there in spring uh, or uh, to see them on the lek or only in winter. My recollection is that that I saw them on the lek in very late winter. Uh, when did you see them? Yeah. And have you been there during the spring to see them as well? It was the first week of April. Okay, so it is actually spring. Yeah, yeah. So it's usually, it's, there's a window of like two or three weeks, uh, end of March, beginning of April, where they're most active, I think. Um, later, it becomes more difficult. Maybe I just thought it was winter because it was so damn cold. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's yes. very cold. It was really cold. Uh, I went up with Bob Hertz to see them at Honey Lake. Um, oh. You know, it's a different location, of course, but. Right. Uh, let me see. Um, so some very specific question about, is that a prime 600 millimeter lens, a Sony? Um, and did you use a teleconverter? Well, uh, up until last week, I was using the, the Sony 200 to 600 uh, zoom. Uh, which has a, a, a maximum aperture of 6.3, uh, f6.3, and uh, I was using it with uh, with an extender, so it was giving me approximately 800 millimeters, um, and uh, that was enough to blur most of the backgrounds. It's not as sharp as a prime, um, but it works. And, and, and last week I I, I finally uh, received a, a 600 uh, f4, the the, the 200. These are, uh, yeah, of course these are costly lenses um actually the 200 to 600 is it's fairly inexpensive i think it's less than two thousand oh, uh, dollars the, the 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 expensive part there was the the camera the sony a9 where it cost me close to four thousand dollars i was hoping maybe i could find a camera for about five hundred dollars but it sounds like no well yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's always a compromise you know uh because you again to blur the pattern you need more focal length and, oh uh, yeah with a, with a zoom you you can get it I'm, uh, I'm really just joking because i i know that this is a serious pursuit and you need serious equipment uh but i'm just so eager and i think a lot of birders are really eager to get out there and and give it a try and try to get some photographs of their own they'll never probably be the caliber uh of what you're able to accomplish because first of all it takes an enormous amount of time and dedication but there are a lot of birders like myself that would like to give it a try uh, with something, you know, to at least document some of our sightings. Right. So my my buddies who um, have, you know, lower budget, uh, some of them have tried the Nikon uh, D500 with the 200 to 500 lens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of my buddies in Chile used that for years uh, and he was happy with it. Good. 
Um, let's see, I'm trying to see if there are any other questions that I haven't asked. Oh, here's a good one. Uh, are, where, do you re where do you recommend staying when you visit during winter? Um, this, the place I'd say that is a, is a lodge that's near Portola. Um, oh, I, I would have to post later the, uh, it's kind of a upscale place. They have a brewery, um, I, it's the, boom, boom, boom. the Chalevio Lodge, yeah. Okay. And, and, the, and the prices are decent, like less than $200 a night. Um, and, uh, and and the rooms are warm and and, and, and really tip top. No, no oh, I'm sure that's important in winter. Do you find that uh, how busy and how crowded is it during the winter? Uh, not at all. People start going there in the spring, um, you know, for various activities. And usually it, the, it's really hard to get a room in, in June, uh, yeah. second, third week of June. Yeah. No, I've definitely noticed, I've noticed that. Um, so I, you really make me want to go there off season. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of us assume that June is the best time, and that is a very good time, but clearly not the only time to go up there. So now I've, I'm gotten all excited about going up there. And between the portions of the, uh, of the Sierra that you've been to, do you have a favorite, whether it's the Yuba Pass area or the Mammoth Lakes, or I've been to all of these at one point or another? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, the. Uh, I really specialized around the the, the Sierra Valley, Juba Pass area, but mm -hmm. I've expanded around, uh, you know, Cayman Valley, kind of Hidden Valley, which has uh, some nice birds too, uh, further north, in, you know, into, um, you know, the Plumas National Forest has also some so, some nice uh, some nice spots. Uh, the low Gold Lake area has, I mean, yeah. it, it's just about you know going around back roads and and finding stuff. Well, I wish you'd been with us when we'd seen the flammulated owl. That would have been really, really fun for all of us <laughs> because we <laughs> could have, would have gotten a, a really good picture, I'm sure. Anyway, okay. uh, I want to thank you so much for being with us. And I also want to let people know that Luis is not only an amazing photographer and presenter, but he's also an important volunteer for us at Audubon. He's responsible for some of our translations into Spanish of our uh, self-guided trips. And I expect or I hope that you'll be able to do some more of those in the future because that's, uh, that's a lot of work that we still have ahead and uh, very much appreciate all your work and effort for that. I know it's time consuming and I know you're busy with family and work and photography, but I, I'm so grateful to have you part of the team. And I wanna thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, this will be a, a, a fantastic addition to our collected recorded presentations, and this will be available on our website uh, quite shortly. You just have to download it and then upload it, and uh, it'll be available for people to view. So thanks very much, for everybody, for coming. Luis, thank you for all of your great work. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you speak with us. And thank you for having me. I want to tell everybody to uh, be safe and enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your week. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, bye.